Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Grave. Finding Jesus and giving Jesus away is at the very core of our identity because we know that we don't come to church. We are the church and we seek to be the church to everyone around us. Here's how we are being the church this week. After a long hiatus, we are thrilled to celebrate the ordinance of baptism today. During the nine o'clock service, Terry Jackson will be baptized and will take the next step in her faith journey. We rejoice with our new sister in Christ and pray for her diligently as she begins her Christian walk. Experience the God-given vocal talents of Wes Hampton on August 14th, right here at First Baptist. Wes has been singing with the Gaither Vocal Band for 15 years and has made a name for himself within the Christian music industry. Tickets are $10 in advance or $15 at the door. Visit our church website or call the church office to reserve your ticket for what is sure to be an incredible night of music and worship. We hope that today during worship, you see Jesus clearer than ever before. Thanks so much for being here. Now, let's worship the Lord together. It is good to see baptisms again. I have missed having those around, and yes, we did, in fact, install a water slide back there, so that's why she got a little pre-baptized first. 
I'm so glad that you're here today. I'm glad that you chose to come and worship with us here at the First Baptist Church of Gray. This morning, as I was helping my, my little girl get ready, I told her, I said, we're going to church. And she said, why, why do we go to church? And the easy thing is, say, well, it's Sunday. We always go to church on Sunday. And I took a moment to tell her that uh, many years ago, when God created the world, he told us to set aside one day to rest and to worship. And today we are doing that. We are resting and we are worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth. So I invite you to stand together. Let's worship the Lord in singing. And later on we'll worship him in the preaching of his word. Let's sing together. Let us worship. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You've been faithful. Every storm, you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You have done great things, God, you do great. And break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great great things. Oh God, you do great things. Amen. God does certainly do wonderful things. And one of the most wonderful things, in fact, the most wonderful thing he ever did was send his son as a sacrifice for mankind that we could be forgiven of our sins through the ultimate perfect sacrifice. And when we think about Jesus and we think about what he did, we're reminded of that verse that says, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 
And that wonderful name is the name of Jesus. You are the word at the beginning, born with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name.
you thanks for that wonderful, powerful, beautiful name. Father, you tell us in your word that at the name of Jesus, demons flee. And we know that speaking that name of Jesus has much power. And we thank you that you gave us that gift. Not just the gift of the power in his name and the power of your Holy Spirit, but God, the gift of salvation through his sacrifice. We pray that we never take that for granted. Father, it is in that spirit that we worship this morning through singing, through the reading and preaching of your word, and through giving. And so we pray that the gifts that are given today and days past and days ahead would be blessed by you for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in our mourning with the love that casts out fear. You are worthy. Working in our waiting, sanctifying us, when beyond our understanding, you're teaching us to trust, your plans are, are still, still to prosper. You are not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. You are wisdom on imagination. understand your way, raining high above the heavens, reaching down in endless grace.
would you stand in honor of the word of the Lord? Hear the words from the prophet Isaiah. I am the first and I am the last. There is no God but me. Who like me can announce the future? Let him say so and make a case before me since I have established an ancient people. Let these gods declare the coming things and what will take place. Do not be startled or afraid. Have I not told you and declared it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God but me? There is no other rock. I do not know any. I love the sarcasm that the Lord throws in there. Let these gods declare the coming things and what will take place. When our God is the only one that speaks of our future like it's already happened. Because he knows what will happen. He knows what will come to pass. Because he is sovereign over all things. Joel and Tiffany just sang it. We're about to hear the word preached about how sovereign the Lord is. And we are found in Christ because of who he says we are. Y'all can clap. That's all right. We can do that. All right, now here's the deal. You just, you just heard the song. Uh, you made a declaration about who you are and what you are. We're going to hear the word that's going to talk seriously about that this morning. And I want you to go away thinking about that because there's a lot of people right now who's got it in their heads to scare us, slam to death, and we're starting to act like we're scared. Get over it. 
Get over it. Let's all get over it. We are not people that are here for this period of time only. I'm a child of God. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm not, I'm jumping ahead of myself, can't help it. I am not here for this life only. And if I get COVID and it gets real bad and I go to the hospital, I guarantee you I'm not going to enjoy it. And I'm not looking forward to it. I think getting on a ventilator is the scariest thing in the world. And being in ICU and I visited people in ICU looks terrifying to me. But you know what? If that happens to me and if I die, I'm just going on a mother adventure. Do you understand? We are not to be afraid like people that have nothing coming in front of us. This is not it for you. This is it for your friends that are not Christians. This is all they've got. And let them be terrified, but you help them understand that you aren't terrified because there is a God in heaven who has prepared a place for you. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Don't you forget it. Don't you forget it. You understand? Y'all can clap. It's okay. Nobody's going to die and go to hell if they do. There you go. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Now, a few years ago, a few years ago, Marvel released a movie called Avengers Infinity Wars. Anybody see that besides me? Avengers? Okay, good. Thank you. A few of you will know what I'm talking about, and I'll fill fill in the rest of you. In that movie, there was a bad guy by the name of Thanos. Thanos looks kind of like, if you're familiar with the Fantastic Four, he looks a little bit like the Thing in the Fantastic Four. He is a villain in a superhero movie, so what he wants to do is to take over the world. But more than take over the world, because we're in a new age, we don't have villains that just want to take over the world. He wants to take over the universe, the whole enchilada. And what he wants to do when he takes over the universe is he wants to kill half of the people that exist throughout Half of the beings that exist all through the universe, that's what Thanos' idea is to do. And in this movie, there's a way he could do that. He collects the infinity stones, and he's got this funky little glove that when he puts the infinity stones in this glove, that when, when it's all, he's got them all in there, he now essentially has the power of God. And with one snap of his fingers, he wipes out half the people in the entire universe. Do y'all remember, now the reason I'm telling you this story, for those of you who have seen the movie, do y'all remember the scene when he gets it, he snaps his fingers, do you remember what it looked like when, when, when his power was executed? People were just walking, or they were standing, or they were running, and they started disintegrating. Y'all remember that? started disintegrating and it's like some of them would start from their hand or some of them start with their feet and it would just turn into a million billion little pieces and it would just sort of float up into the air and fall to the ground and some of them would blow away I found where that came from I know where the idea came from right here in the book of Daniel it's right here in the book of Daniel Uh, and we're going to read about it in just a few minutes it's it's sort of cool And maybe it didn't come from there. Maybe they think they had the idea themselves. I think J.K. Rowling thinks that she got the idea for Harry Potter all on her own. But if you've watched Harry Potter or read the books, a boy is born and has to die to save his people. Have y'all heard that story before? That would be a yes. Y'all heard of Jesus, right? Uh Uh-huh. I don't know if she sees that or not, but it's pretty obvious to me that that's where she got her idea anyway move along Daniel chapter 2 I'm not going to read the whole thing I am so excited about this passage we're not going to read the whole thing to you it's long you got to do the whole chapter it's chapter 2 in the book of Daniel it goes from verse 1 to verse 49 if we read it that would take up about all of my time what I want to ask you to do if you haven't read it already I posted on Facebook what we're going to study so if you've read it that's great if you haven't that's okay I'm going to recap everything for you but go home after we've talked about it and read this again it won't take you long it'll take maybe 10 minutes for you to read it but read it in light of what we're talking about okay read it in light of what you hear and understand how this whole story fits together. It's really pretty good stuff. Here you go. Daniel 2, verses 1 through 6. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. 
His spirit was troubled and his sleep, sleep left him. Then he commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, and the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. When we read this stuff, it sounds to us kind of uh, uh, fairy tale-ish. It sounds kind of uh, storybookish kind of stuff. A king's going to decree they'll kill everybody. Yeah, these guys back in those days were kind of ruthless. And if people didn't do what they wanted to do, they did have them executed. It sort of kept order pretty good. You didn't want to cross the king because it would be a bad day. So this, this happened. And Nebuchadnezzar had a nightmare. In fact, it was more like a night terror. It sounds pretty sanitary in English. He had a dream, his spirit was troubled, but Daniel uses some words in there that puts a little punch to this thing. Daniel says that he woke up hammered. It doesn't mean he woke up drunk. What it meant was, you've, woken, you've awakened in the middle of the night, every one of us in here have, awakened in the middle of the night with a terrible, terrible nightmare. Anybody in here never had a nightmare ever in your entire life? I've had nightmares, and you wake up in the middle of the night, and this is one of those whopper nightmares where you wake up in the middle of the night and you are so afraid and your heart is beating a thousand miles it is hammering in your chest that's the word that Daniel uses is that king was hammered it was hammering in his chest and you're breathing like you've run a race and you are absolutely terrified you've done this I've done this where you've where you've had the nightmare and you wake up and you are so afraid that you don't even want to move. You're not even sure what's going on in your room. You don't know if somebody's in your room. You don't know if something's going on in your room. You don't know what's going on. It's dark. You can't see. You are terrified. That's where the king was. That's where Nebuchadnezzar was. That's the kind of dream that he had. It absolutely terrified him. Now, he had a whole host the king had a whole host of what I call fortune tellers. He called them Chaldeans. And those guys represented every known God that he possibly could know. And every bit of wisdom that he possibly could find all across the land. And he had those because he didn't want to miss anything. He wanted to make sure that every base was covered. And he had somebody that could cover all those bases. So he calls them in and he says, dudes, here's what I need you to do. I had a dream. Tell me the dream. Tell me what it means. You tell me my dream and tell me what it, what it means. And the ones of you that can do it will get gifts and rewards and great honor. But if you can't, I will have every Chaldean in the kingdom dismembered that means while they're alive they're going to have them pulled apart see they were pretty serious about the way they did this stuff dismembered your houses will be leveled which means probably they're going to kill your family too and the spot where your house is will become the town dump now if you read the king james version it says that your house will become a dung heap which is really a more accurate translation of what's going to happen because what he's going to do is he's going to tear your house down, leave a pile of rubble, and tell everybody in the community that that's the town dump and everything horrible and everything awful, including the sewage out of their house, is going to be poured on that spot to totally dishonor you. That's the king's whole idea. I will make you a scourge in front of everybody I promise you I will destroy your name and your reputation he said the word for me is firm if you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation you shall be torn limb from limb and your house shall be laid in ruins he was serious and the Chaldeans were a bit perplexed see dream interpretation was their gig that's what they did that was one of their things they believed 
kind of like we do now, a little bit. Sometimes you have a dream that you know was because you had pizza, right? You had pepperoni pizza before you went to bed, you had too much to eat, so you had funky dreams all night long. We know that happens. But sometimes you have a dream and you wake up in the morning and you go, what does that dream mean? What, that, that dream had to have meant something. Well, they, in, in Eastern society, and it's still there today, among Muslims where there are no Christians, there are stories of Muslims having dreams of a man called Jesus, and they are saved because they have these dreams about a man called Jesus. They still operate that way over there. They believe that the dreams were from the gods. It's the way the, commu- the gods communicated with people. And so these Chaldeans, over a period of time, over a period of time, they had collected dreams and collected what these dreams meant. They observed to see what was going on around them and how everything worked out. And they had books of dreams and interpretations. So it wasn't like they were looking at tea leaves or chicken entrails and telling the king something. What would happen is the king on normal course would come in, hey guys, I had a dream last night. Here's what my dream is. What did that mean? And so they would go to their books and they'd find something good because you're not going to tell a king that will have you dismembered something bad, right? So you tell him something good and everybody's fat, dumb, and happy. And that's the way it works out. Except in this case, the king doesn't want to play that game. He knows that's what they do. He's not a stupid man. People that get in power's authority typically aren't ignorant people. So he's, he's in authority. He don't want to play the game. He says, here's the deal. This is what he's thinking to himself. If I really want to know what this thing means, I've got to get you to tell me the dream. Because if you can tell me the dream, then you can tell me the interpretation. I'm not going to play any other way. The Chaldeans protested. And then they said something that is key to this whole passage. If you got your Bibles and you're looking at Daniel, it's verse 11. The thing that the king asks is difficult. Some translations even say impossible, which is a good rendering of the word. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and here's the point. And no one can show it to the king except the gods. There's the, that's what this whole chapter hangs on. No one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. King, what you're asking is impossible, since the gods gave you the dream. They're the only ones that know the dream. And I don't know if you've noticed lately, king, but there are no gods around here that live with us. So this is going to be like really, really kind of hard. And the king says, not a problem. Hey, kill them. Boom. That's the way he did it. Just kill them. So the king's executioners start rounding up the Chaldeans. This is such a good story. I hope y'all enjoy it. The, the king's executioner starts going around the town. They didn't all live in one place. So he starts going around the cities and the cities right around where the palace was to g- gather all of the Chaldeans together. And he's going to kill every last one of them. And finally, that's how Daniel enters the story. Because Daniel and his three friends are Chaldeans. That's what they're being trained to be as Chaldeans. So the executioner comes to get Daniel and his three friends too. Daniel hadn't heard anything about it. Can you imagine sitting at home, have somebody knock on the door and say, hey, I need you to come with me. I'm going to kill you because you didn't do what the king wanted you to do. And you'd go, whoa, 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 whoa. What did the king ask us to do? Which is what Daniel did. And, and the executioner explained to him. And Daniel said, essentially, give me a minute. I'll tell you what the dream is, and I'll tell you the interpretation. That's pretty bold, because he doesn't know if God's going to give it to him or not, but he's trusting that the Lord will. Give me a minute, and I'll give you the dream and its interpretation. So Daniel gets with his three friends. They have an all-night prayer meeting. Sometime during the night, the Lord reveals the dream and its meaning to Daniel. Daniel's brought before the king, and this is what happens. Now listen, this is verses 26 and 20 uh, through 28 all right are you ready the king, the king declared to daniel whose name was belshazzar are you able to make known to me the dream that i have seen and its interpretation daniel answered the king and said no <laughs> how about that you 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 said if we didn't do it you would you'd, you'd kill us and his answer is no No wise men, no enchanters, no magicians or astrologers can show the king the mystery that king has asked. Remember what I said the point was earlier? Hear Daniel answer. But there is a God in heaven. Before they said, 
No one can show it to the king except the gods, plural. Daniel says, let me correct you. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days, your dream and the visions of your head as you lay down in the bed of these. And Daniel goes on to tell the, the, the king what he dreamed and what the dream meant. Now, that's kind of bold. That's kind of bold. The king says, are you able to do this? Daniel says, no, not really, but there's a God in heaven. There's a God in heaven who does these things, and he made known to the king what will be in the latter days. Daniel tells the king the dream. He tells him the interpretation. He and his three friends are rewarded, and no Chaldeans are harmed in the making of this movie. It all worked out real good. That's how it went. That's an excellent, excellent story. It is chock full of stuff. It has so much stuff in it. Like I've said every week just about, we could talk about this for hours. It took me a long time to figure out what to talk about and what not to talk about this morning so that we can talk about some more stuff later. This is really good. Daniel chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. 36 through 38. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of men, the beasts of the field, and the birds of heaven, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold. So point number one, point number one, God establishes rulers. God establishes rulers. We've studied, we studied Romans 13, we talked about being submissive to the government as long as it's a godly government and all that kind of good stuff. We have to understand no matter who's in power, God establishes rulers. He says in verse 37, you, O king, the king of kings, lowercase k's, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, you've given the You've given Nebuchadnezzar the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory. He goes on to say that God's given you everything. He's given you power over all the people of the land, all the animals of the land, all the territories of the land. Now, you're going to say to yourself, if you're thinking about last week, you're thinking about, Randy, you said that last week. Uh Uh-huh, I did. We're saying it this week. We're going to say it again in two weeks. We're going to say it again a couple of weeks after that. Now, here's what. You're going to go, well, Randy, that's kind of boring. No, let me help you remember something. When you hear it once and it perks up in your ears, you go, hmm, that's interesting. When you hear it twice, you go, maybe I ought to pay attention to that. When you hear it three times, you need to lean back and go, God's trying to tell me something here. You're going to hear it at least five times, if not more. God wants you to get this through your thick head. He wants me to get this through my thick head, that God is in charge. God is in charge. He establishes rulers. And the second point, he establishes the rulers that he wants to establish. And this is stated over and over again through the Bible. Jeremiah, you go to the book of Jeremiah chapter 27. Jeremiah 27 is talking about what's going on right now in history. And Jeremiah says, thus says right now in Daniel, thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, this is what you say to your masters. It is I, God, who by my great powers and my outstretched arm have made the earth with men and animals that are on the earth, and I give it to whomever it seems right to me. I give it to whomever it seems right to me. God establishes the rulers that seem right to him. Let me help you understand something. Obama was elected in 2008. I'm not a fan. I'm not an Obama fan, had never been an Obama fan. When he was re-elected in 2012, I still was an Obama fan. When Trump was elected in 2016, I am certain because you have let me know that some of you are not a fan of his. But whether you are a fan of either one of these guys or you're not a fan of either one of these guys, you have to understand, I have to understand that God's in control and God gave the presidency of the United States to whomever seems right to him. You understand? Do you get it? God did that. That has to mean something to us. If God appoints a person to be president, there has to be a reason. And I know there's going to be people today that are going to be chomping at the bit to tell me the reason why God's done this. But let me help you understand. 
that I do not believe in our lifetimes that we will understand why what's going on right now is going on right now. Because you know what? It ain't about us. It's about what the Lord is doing. History is going to reveal why things are as they are. We don't know right now because we're in the thick of it. And because we are in the thick of it, and because we don't understand it, that doesn't mean that you and I get to wig out and act like crazy people. Do you understand? We do not get to wig out as Christians and act like crazy people. Because when you lose your mind over President Trump, or you lose your mind over President Obama, or you lose your mind over any elected leader, Daniel's words, you, O king, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, you're wigging out on God. You're wigging out on God. Chill out, guys. Slow down on the keyboard just a little bit. You're not going to change anybody's mind. You're just going to get a fight. Slow down. Listen. Watch. Pay attention. God is doing something. Look for it. In fact, in this environment we live in right now, Daniel turns out to be a really good role model for us. In the midst of all this crazy, crazy that's happened. Pop test, pop quiz, pop quiz. Raise your hand if you know the answer. How old was Daniel when, when this story, chapter 2, is told? How old's Daniel? Anybody want to venture a guess? Anybody want to venture a guess at all? Anybody? You think when you read the story because he's so calm, that he's got to be a wizened old man with gray hair, sort of thinning in the back, sort of like me? That's what you think. Daniel was probably 18 years old, maybe 20, but that's all he was, 18 to 20 years old. Rewind back to chapter 1, verse 4. The king commands, commands Ashpenaz to bring to Babylon youths without blemish, he says. Now think about this. We look at our teenagers and we, we think that our teenagers, you know, we, we even have scientific evidence now that a person's, I don't know, I'll probably have this wrong, Billy, don't shoot me, their prefrontal cortex or something that they've got in their brain, you medical people, Terry, that know anatomy, all this stuff, that that, that whatever it is in their brain isn't fully developed until they're 25 years old, so of course they're idiots until they're 25 years old. I can attest to that because I was an idiot until I was 25 years old. I understand that, but you know what? It doesn't have to be that way. Daniel was 20, and look at how he operated, how he lived in a time where he could have had Nebuchadnezzar derangement syndrome, and he could have gone off on everybody about everything how did Daniel handle living in a year that certainly was as crazy as 2020 think about it Daniel was a teenager he was taken from his parents he was kidnapped taken to a foreign land where they didn't speak his language they didn't eat his food they were a completely different place. They started brainwashing him the minute that he got there. How did he act? Well, the first thing that happened, when he got some pushback, he reasoned the problem out calmly. He reasoned calmly. He didn't react emotionally. He leaned back. 20-year-old kid, maybe 18. And he leans back and he reasoned the problem calmly. Remember in chapter 1 when the food, uh, about the food and Daniel's three friends didn't want to defile. Y'all remember we talked about using the word defile or spoil themselves with the king's food. When they requested home cooking, you know, we want some, they, they, they didn't want fried chicken, but they certainly wanted the squash and the okra and the green beans and the mashed potatoes and the uh, tomato slices and all the stuff that goes with it. You know, they wanted the vegetables. When they asked for home cooking and the guy in church says, no. Nah, think we can do that because the king would probably have me killed when you guys start looking good or looking bad and instead of organizing the boycott or blowing up Ashpenaz or the king on Twitter or going on to a hunger strike he very calmly says why don't we just try this for 10 days and see how it works out 
And because of his attitude, God used his attitude to change this guy's mind. God used his attitude to change this guy's mind because he reasoned calmly. He reasoned the problem out calmly. Secondly, when he was physically threatened, the king's going to have us all killed. COVID's going to kill every one of us. We're all going to die of coronavirus. That's what the news is saying. That's every time I listen to the news, oh, the world's coming to an end. There are three million cases. We're all going to die. The sun's going to blow up in the sky. We're all going to die. Well, here's Daniel. We're all going to die. Literally, he didn't wig out. He didn't wig out. Verse 14, then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He didn't get all riled up. He didn't act with righteous indignation. Daniel replied to the very man who was going to be his executioner. Arioch was the chief executioner. He would be standing there when Daniel died. He replies to this guy with prudence and discretion. Prudence means caution. Discretion means he chose his words carefully. Sounds smart to me. He was calm. He didn't wig out. He was cautious in what he said. He chose his words very carefully. And he could do this because he realized that he was not in control of the situation, but God was. And see, that's the, that's the theme that keeps recurring over and over and over again that God wants us to see about our lives right now. We are not in control of this situation, but God is. So, reason calmly, don't wig out. Third thing, allow God room to work. Give God the room to work. And listen, if you're a type A like I am, this is, I mean, this is convicting to us. How many times do you see a problem and you jump on it with both feet before you even think about anything? I know what to do. Boom, let's go let's get it done. Let's get it done. Let's make it happen. I know what's supposed to happen here. And how many times have you done that only to find out later that number one, you answered the wrong question, or number two, you answered the right question the wrong way, or number three, you used a shotgun to fix the problem when what you needed to use was a rifle and you got a whole lot of collateral damage that you've got to go clean up. How many times have you done that? I know I'm not the only one that's a type A in this room, and I know that I'm not the only one that's done that very thing. We don't allow God room to work. Slow down a little bit, take a deep breath, be calm, reason calmly, don't wig out and get all emotional, allow God some room to work. Or a better way to put it simply this, since God is in control, our job's to follow him. Since God is in control, our job is to follow him. Well, I try, you know why we don't? Ego and pride. We know what we're doing. We're going to be number one. And in order to follow God, we have to back up a step and say, wait a minute. You guide me. You lead me. You show me. Sounds easy. How did Daniel do that? How did Daniel do it? Man, I'm telling you, it is here as a stinking blueprint. It is gorgeous. Verses 17 through 19. Where'd they put those? Right here. Then Daniel went to his house and he made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companion, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel did these things. Number one, Daniel gathered with his trusted small group. See, pride and ego are going to make you run it alone. You don't need nobody else. Daniel goes to his trusted small group. He doesn't tell just anybody. Listen, guys, you don't go to Sunday school and tell your Sunday school class the deepest, darkest secrets of your life. That is not a safe place to do that in. Uh, there might be a lot of good people in there, but there might be one person in there whose favorite sin is gossip. And before you can get home, it's on Facebook. Please pray for Wayne. He's having trouble at work with a female co-worker. That's just what he wants to have out there, you know. He's not having trouble with a female co-worker. I just saw Wayne on the front, okay. So, 
Well, it's on, it's on Facebook now. <laughs> Facebook Live. Daniel gathered his trusted group. He had a group of people that he trusted. Secondly, he explained the problem to them, and they dedicated themselves to pray for as long as necessary. Sometimes you've got to pray for a long time. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you pray the answer's right there. Everybody knows this is what needs to be done. But they, they said, we will pray for as long as necessary. And then they expected God to answer. Now, see, here's the deal. We say we expect God to answer, but generally we don't. We expect that we'll pray, and then we'll do what we do, and then God, uh, and then things will work out, and then we'll say, well, God caused that to happen, which in a sense, God did cause it to happen, but it's not exactly the way he wanted it, you know, it would have been better another way maybe or something, I don't know. Give him a second, and expect him to tell you the best thing to do. They prayed for mercy. I got to work on that one. The mercy thing, the commentators didn't say much about it, but it just keeps jumping at me that they prayed for mercy. They didn't just sit there praying, Lord, give us this, give us this, give us this. They prayed, Lord, listen, here's the deal. If you don't reveal the king's dream and its meaning, not only will we die, but all the other Chaldeans will die as well. We know that you know. We know that you can reveal this. Have mercy on us and show us the dream. And when they did that, God showed them the dream. The mercy thing to me, I think the mercy thing to me is, is an understanding on their part that they knew that, you know what, if it's going to give God glory for all of us to die, then we're going to die. And we're willing to go there. Now that's easy to say, right? Yeah, I'll die for Jesus. But when you're facing an executioner, that's a different story. And I think they prayed for mercy because they were saying that very thing. Lord, we will, <clears throat> we will die if that's what you require of us. But Lord, please have mercy on us because we ain't really want to do the die thing. It's going to mess up our calendar. So if you would, reveal this dream to us and reveal its meaning. So it happened. God was waiting on them to do this. When they did it, he orchestrated it to work out this way. Now, this is crazy. This is all God's doing. And I believe God was doing it for one crazy reason. Now think about this. All of this stuff that's gone on, these, the dream and the guys, and he's going to kill all these people, and there's terror all over the land in the Chaldeans because of this fear that the king is going to have them dismembered and their houses turned into dung heaps. Their children would die, their wives would die, their progeny would be wiped out, their name would be wiped off the face of this earth. All these horrible things going on. And then God does what he does for verse 47. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods, <clears throat> capital G of gods, capital L, lords of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. The Lord is working to save Nebuchadnezzar. He's doing all of this to bring one man to salvation. Now, this one man can change the world. But you watch, as we go through the rest of Daniel, you watch, the Lord keeps doing these things to Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar is going to get to a point where eventually, this is spoiler alert, he is going to say that you are the God who is God over me. That's what he's doing. God's doing all of this to save that man. What if all of this is happening to change a world leader, to change a president, to change a county commissioner, to change a school board chairman. What if all of this is, is for that? We, we don't know. We won't know. But God was working. So, a whole lot of crazy going on around us, more crazy than I've ever seen in my life. It is pushing us all, myself included, to the limits of our sanity. <clears throat> don't lose sight of the prize. God knows what he's doing. Everything that's happening is happening for a reason. We can take it to the bank. God's working his plan, and all who endure to the end will be saved. Now, I'm out of time, but I've got just a little bit more. 
so y'all give me 10 minutes to finish this up because I haven't told you where Thanos is in this story yet, and it would be not right for you to go home without knowing that. Here it is. The king dreamed there was a gigantic image. It's the end of chapter 2. That there was this gigantic image made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, and clay. Have you ever heard the saying in your life, they had feet of clay? If you've ever heard that phrase, they had feet of clay, this is it. This is where that came from right here. He had feet of clay. In a nutshell, each portion, now king's in bed, and he, and he has this dream, and there's this gigantic statue in front of him. Each portion of this giant statue uh, represents a future kingdom, what's going to happen in the future. Nebuchadnezzar is the golden head. The Medeo Persian, not the Medea Persian, but the Medeo Persian Empire was the silver chest and arms. The Greek Empire is the bronze abdomen and uh, thighs. And then the iron legs and the iron and clay feet is Rome. Now, each of these various materials didn't relate to the kingdom's strength. In other words, because Nebuchadnezzar is gold and Rome is iron and gold is more expensive than iron, then there's, he was stronger than Rome. That's not true. That's, that's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about is morality. That as Nebuchadnezzar, even as vile as he was, his reign was more moral than the Roman reign. And y'all know that straight out of history. Go read your history books. The reason Rome fell is because of its immorality. We know that. That is documented secular history apart from the Bible. That's how come Rome fell. All of this, all of this is the future. You can check it in history books. This is what happened. But now here's where Thanos came in. The terrifying part of the dream was not only the fact that there's this giant thing in front of him, this giant statue in front of him that came out of nowhere. The most terrifying parts, verse 34 and 35. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken as pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the earth that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Did you hear? Did you hear Thanos' disintegration snap there? If you don't know what I'm talking about, disintegration snap, go on YouTube and type in Thanos disintegration snap, and it will show you this video of what I'm talking about right here on YouTube. It's about two minutes long. All together were broken into pieces, and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried it away. This is the exact image from the, from the Avengers movie, and that's what scared, Than, uh, scared Nebuchadnezzar absolutely to death. He woke up in a cold sweat with his heart pounding in his chest, willing to kill hundreds of people because this stone came out of nowhere, carved by some unseen force. This force threw that stone onto the feet of this gigantic statue which was imposing and threatening in front of him and it started to disintegrate into a million billion pieces just up its legs up its body it disintegrated a wind blew it all away that scared him to death and the rock that hit the ground kept growing and growing and growing until it became a great mountain and it filled the whole earth. Now, here's why this is cool. See, the Bible is not individual little stories like we study in Sunday school. It all fits together. And the Bible explains what Thanos, I mean, what Thanos, stop that, what Nebuchadnezzar saw. This is what that mountain was from Scripture, Isaiah chapter 2. This is so cool. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest mountain, the highest of mountains, shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow into it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. So the kingdom of God, that rock, was the kingdom of God. But it's better than that. Because Jesus says this in Matthew 21. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. 
This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Nebuchadnezzar saw Jesus, and it terrified him. Do you understand? He saw Jesus, and it absolutely terrified him. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the Lord to the glory of God the Father, even the greatest kings on earth. I think mm, if it wouldn't scare y'all to death, I'd shout glory in a story, in a story here that is talked about over here and it's talked about way over here. The same story runs all the way through that the Lord is God above all and that his whole, his whole purpose in history is to draw a people to himself to make them his own, to save them, to give them new life, to give them a place after they're dead, to give them new life in this life, to give them a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth chance on this earth. The story is told over and over and over again. Do not fear. In the midst of all of this, be calm, don't wig out, Give God room to work. He is doing amazing things. Let's pray. Father, I've, I thank you that you give me the opportunity as a pastor and a preacher to spend so much time in your word reading these things and hearing these things and what other smarter people than me have talked about over all the years and seeing how you've pieced all of this together to reveal yourself to your people. And Lord, I truly pray that you will help your congregation to get the same excitement that I feel from this text. That I don't have to be afraid, that I don't have to worry. That you are truly in control of all that is. And as frightening as it is and as hard as things might be and as uncertain as just the, 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 the mere safety of us going to a big city is right now. The Lord, in the middle of it, you're going to give us what to do. And you're going to show us how to navigate. And Lord, if you would require from us our lives, it would only be this life. And then we would be in your presence in a place that we can't even begin to understand. Lord, we tell people at funerals not to, not to grieve as people who have no hope, but Lord, help us to live right now not as people who have no hope. We have a great God who is powerful over all. And as surely as you save Daniel, you'll save us. As surely as you have done this for thousands of years, you will do it again now. I pray, Lord, that you will touch hearts today, that you will make hearts of stone, hearts of flesh, that you will write your law on those hearts, that you will give a desire in those people to follow you all the days of their life knowing that that life will be eternal. And your people would be strong so that those that are around us would wonder why we are like we are and would ask and we would tell them with certainty that there is a God in heaven who is in control and he loves me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to offer you an opportunity this morning to respond.
to the message, to the music, to everything that you've heard. Y'all, it is weird times. It is definitely weird times, and it is frightening. And there are people, and that's not a conspiracy theory, people make money off of television. They have reasons to make you want to watch. So they have reasons for us to be afraid so that we will watch so they'll make more money. Y'all, calm. Don't wig out. Give God room to work. Take a deep breath. He loves us. Christians, please help me and I'll help you to know that we stand on the rock of ages, that we cannot fall, we cannot falter. It's okay. You're going to be fine. And for those of you who have never trusted Jesus as your Savior, I invite you this morning to turn to Him and say, I want what you have. I've been following a path all my life, doing the best I can. I'm not a bad person. I'm not a bad person. I've done a few things, but I'm not a bad person. Every funeral I do, somebody says to me, they would give you the shirt off their back. You know why? Because most of them probably would have. They're, good. They're a good person. They want to do good. But you can't do good, ultimate good, apart from the Lord. He's the one that shows us the way to go. So I invite you this morning, no matter what you've done or where you've been or who you've talked to or what anybody's ever said to you or done to you, there is one who loves you so much that he wants wants to walk with you forever ever and he'll never let you go no matter how ridiculous you act because he'll keep pulling you back i invite you this morning to make that commitment that i want to follow you and you turn you turn to the lord and simply pray lord i want to follow you please save me show me what to do and he'll do it I'll be down front if you want to talk to me about it. After the service, I'll be here. Austin's in the back. You can talk to Austin if you want to talk to him. This morning, do what the Lord leads you to do. Won't y'all stand? Justice and mercy embraced There's a <clears throat> And our measureless debt was erased Jesus, to you we lift our eyes Jesus, our glory the lion awake what a glorious dawn fear of death is gone for we carry his life in our veins Jesus to you we lift our eyes 
Jesus, our glory and our pride. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes to the heavens. Our King will return for his own. Every knee will bow, every tongue will shout. All glory to Jesus alone. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our pride. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our pride. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. As Josh comes to say the prayer, I do want to say right quick, normally we would ask Terry and her family to stand by the door and everybody to come shake hands and all that. And I know that y'all are not going to social distance correctly when you leave, but I don't want to be the instigator of it. So, y'all just give Terry a hand. God bless you, Terry, for following Jesus. And she's right there, by the way, so that's Terry. Go, Josh. I mean, everybody, I want you to remember, uh, we didn't come to church because we are the church, so go and be the church. But before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day and just thank you for all the blessings you've given us. Thank you for, for Randy, dear Lord, that he puts things in such a way that we can understand. Uh, and, and we just thank you for that. Thank you for, for giving him those words so that we can understand, dear Lord. Um, just want to ask that you be with us as we go from here, um, as we go our separate ways, and just help us to carry your message to everybody that we come in contact with. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.